Brooklyn Independent Television. Coming up on Health Beat Brooklyn, how's Velma Mullen doing with the Wellness for Life program? I'm getting there. For months, we followed along as she tried to lose weight, exercise more, and get to a healthier place. So, what's the prognosis? I would like to introduce our grand prize winner. In our studio, we learn about lupus, a disease that's still something of a mystery to modern medicine. It mimics a lot of other diseases, so this is what makes lupus extremely hard to be diagnosed. Is that why they call it the great imitator? The bed campaign against hunger provides all sorts of food, but their real passion is the produce they grow themselves. Rosemary, mint, basil, and sage. Okay, so it's not exactly Simon and Garfunkel, but they could never make this claim. When a mother cannot afford to purchase um, two pounds of tomatoes, we can assist in that. And... In Brighton Beach, a Russian Orthodox priest helps homeless men with addiction issues. Drinking and drinking and drinking. If we have a lot, a lot of guys we need to accommodate, we can even put mattresses all around here. But Father Vadim's tiny church has its own problems to deal with. All this and more on Health Beat Brooklyn. Welcome to Health Beat Brooklyn on Brooklyn Independent Television. I'm Dr. Monica Sweeney. Over the past few months, we brought you the story of a woman named Velma as she's participated in a Brooklyn hospital program called Wellness for Life. Velma, with the help of the program's director, Karen Congro, set herself three goals, to lose weight, to learn how to eat better, and by so doing, to get herself off certain medications. Here's Health Beats Tati Amara with the latest on Velma. We first introduced you to Velma Mullen at the start of the year as she embarked on her journey to better health through the Wellness for Life program at Brooklyn Hospital. I just want to get my body a little bit healthier. And some recipes that will work for you? She had just started working with nutritionist Karen Congro, who heads up the program. So that's some of the breakthrough food advice that I want to share with you. And of course, there's a lot more where that came from. Velma's goals included getting her blood pressure and cholesterol normalized, lowering the dosage of her diabetes medication, and to lose weight to fit back into some of her favorite clothes. This is what I'm going to get back into and have them taken in. So. We also followed Velma as she worked out some of her obstacles, like the big hurdle of reading nutritional labels. That's and how lot. many teaspoons of sugar? Five. Okay. That's a lot of sugar. That's a lot of sugar. So you see why these are not the best choices. And since, she's made considerable progress. <laughs> I feel wonderful. I know I've lost some, but I feel very good with the few pounds that I've lost. Her current test result numbers speak for themselves. Her cholesterol is now 198, reaching her doctor's recommendation of under 200. Her blood pressure is a normal 120 over 90 on half the medication dosage. And her A1C, measuring blood sugar control, went from 7.1 to her goal of 6.5. My next goal is just to continue to mainly to eat healthier and lose the weight. To make sure that happens, Velma continues to hone her nutrition skills with Karen. Veggies can be a little deceiving. You think veggies and you just say, okay, that's sort of a you know, freebie, but it's not. If it's starchy, you count it as a carb exchange. And to work out the new hurdles. This time, it's exercise. The exercise is the hardest thing, but uh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Karen has managed to find a solution for that as well. So, what you do in this instance is you watch your TV show, it could be your favorite show, and then when it comes time for a commercial, you get up and do your exercise for the two to three minutes. Now that's interesting. You sit back down, 
Next commercial comes on, you do the same. By the end of the TV show, you've gotten between 23, 24 to 28 minutes of exercise. She's made a complete change in a really short period of time. You're talking months. But she did get m the basics down pat, which I feel is the reason why she advanced so quickly. She's happier because she feels that she's in control of, of what she's eating and she sees the results. They're making her feel like she can accomplish a lot and then that makes her more motivated to continue. Because you're not just walking in place, shuffling your feet a little. But Velma gives much of the credit to Karen and Wellness for Life. I've gone to a nutritionist before. I've been to two different ones and they handed me a paper and told me to do this, do this, do this. But they didn't explain it like Karen. She brings people in to explain it and when you, you, they explain it to you, it sticks a little bit better. And, it would really and count, there's no you know, doubt like five, it's all pounds. working in Velma's favor. I would like to introduce our grand prize winner at this time is Velma Mullen. Uh, it was really a revelation how rapidly you made these changes. So I, I definitely want to award you with this. Thank you very Lovely. much. Lovely, and we're going to give it you this little... It was a journey. It was a journey. I feel ecstatic. I feel very happy. I feel very happy because I did this. Yeah, I can't wait to tell my family because I have those dresses to get into. So I will definitely be more... I'm more motivated now than I was before. So For Health Beat Brooklyn, thanks, thanks I'm thanks Tati Amara. Oh. Good luck yeah. and call me. Okay. Certain diseases target specific demographic groups. One of them is lupus. For reasons not completely understood, about 90% of the million and a half Americans with lupus are women, mainly younger women. In addition, compared to Caucasian women, African Americans are three times and Latinas and Asians are two times more likely to develop signs and symptoms. Here to tell us more about this disease and their efforts to combat it are Diane Gross, the National Director of Program Development for the New York-based SLE Lupus Foundation, and Tayumika Zurita, who leads the foundation's Lupus Center of Brooklyn. Thank you both for being here. There are a lot of people listening who don't know what lupus is. So what is lupus? Well, lupus is an autoimmune disease in which the body immune system attacks its own healthy tissues and organs such as the brain, the kidneys, and the heart. Um, it mimics a lot of other diseases, so this is what makes lupus extremely hard to be diagnosed. Is it's, that why they call it the great imitator? Correct. It, that's exactly why they call it, because a lot of times you have, it's a young woman's disease, so you may have a young woman who may go into the emergency room and the doctors may say, oh, it's just the flu. It feels like having the flu every day, but it's not the flu, or they misdiagnose, may, may misdiagnose it with fibromyalgia, arthritis, and because the symptoms are so similar. And we know that in public health, the key is prevention, prevention, prevention. But in lupus, there's no such thing as prevention. The key is early diagnosis and treatment. So tell me what the Systemic Lupus Erythematosus Lupus Foundation is. What do you do? Well, the SLE Lupus Foundation provides services for people with lupus and their families. And we also support research. So we do a lot of outreach in the community to make people aware of the signs and symptoms of lupus. We do outreach to healthcare providers and social service agencies. And we support a lot of research that's done here in New York City. And we provide services such as support groups and wellness programs. I'm sure you've had instances where people have gone repeatedly to the doctor and not been diagnosed. Correct. I can think of a, one of my patients who was diagnosed in 2007 and she continually went to the emergency room almost three times a week and they kept telling her it's the flu, it's the flu. But she knew her body and she knew that something else was wrong. And then that same year she, they told her she had pneumonia nine times. She decided to go to another hospital and they finally died. Pneumonia, did you say nine times? Nine times. First the flu and then and pneumonia. And then pneumonia nine times. But she knew something was wrong. 
the, it came a point where she would go in the emergency room and the doctors, the nurses already knew her. And they'll be like, here comes the, this crazy lady again. So she decided to go to another hospital. It was diagnosed. And now her lupus is being managed properly. You know, you also said, here comes this crazy lady again. So is that something that people are often called when they have lupus? Well, that they have anxiety or a mental illness or... Unfortunately, I mean, that does happen because the signs of lupus can be very hard to describe. And, you know, if you're complaining of muscle and joint pain or extreme fatigue, it may be, well, you've got small kids at home, you're very busy, you're trying to juggle a job and family, you know, it's normal to be tired. But being able to, for people to really be able to convey that, that it's not just I'm tired, I really can't move my body, I can't get out of bed. And it, it's really extreme fatigue. And sometimes providers just don't really understand the degree of what the client or the patient is going through. But at least here in Brooklyn, we have resources. We have places that people can go to. You've already talked about the fatigue and the joints and so forth. But there are lots of other. Actually, if I remember correctly from medical school, lupus can affect every organ in the body. Correct. And does. But what is the thing that most people who know anything about lupus, what's the first thing that they think about? What's the first thing that they say? I think people think about the rash. The They're rash. What, describe it, please, because it's only in about 15%, mm -hmm. but everybody, when they say lupus, if they know something mm -hmm. about it. So well, what is the... It's called a mylar rash or a butterfly rash, and it tends to be on the upper part of the cheeks, and it spreads out symmetrically across the nose and across the cheeks. And when somebody walks in with that rash, that's lupus. They can, they can get diagnosed. <laughs> right. Immediately. But that's only 15% right. of the time. Yes. Because not everybody presents with that rash. And people will have other kinds of rashes. And there is a type of lupus called discoid lupus, which just affects the skin. But um, one of the symptoms of lupus is other rashes, not necessarily just the butterfly rash. You talk about all of the difficulty diagnosing lupus. So that one of the things we want people to know before the show is over is what to do if they have been going continually uh, to the doctor with various symptoms, because that's what happens. One time it's the kidney, one time it's your joints, one time it's something else. What are some of the things that they can do to try and figure out what's going on themselves and then where they can go to uh, get an, a professional opinion? Because here in Brooklyn, we're very fortunate. We have some centers and I happen to know that. So right. first of all, tell us about what you all do in your outreach. Okay, the first thing that I would recommend that they do, they can go to our website, call our number, and they can be referred to the Brooklyn Center, which is located downtown Brooklyn, but we service all of Brooklyn. It's the only lupus center in Brooklyn. It's unique with non-traditional outreach. We offer support groups. We offer um, referrals. That's once you've been diagnosed. Yeah, or if you haven't, it's also for those who think they might have lupus. As we mentioned earlier, it mimics other diseases. So you might be at the stage where I might have a young female calling and saying I'm sick all the time. I'm in college. I can't get out of bed. Um, the bus stop is two blocks away and it takes me like 10 minutes to, to walk to the bus stop. I have to stop every every five seconds. This is not normal for someone who's young. Lupus attack females in their childbearing age, so 15 to 45. These are females sure. at the prime of their life. So when they call, some of them have not been diagnosed. So we refer them to lupus specialists, which are called rheumatologists. Um, and we work closely with doctors at Brooklyn Hospital, at Kings County, at Downstate, New York Methodist, basically a lot of the medical centers in Brooklyn. And we do whatever we can to make the transition because lupus is very devastating. It's a dangerous disease that needs to be managed properly. And the sad thing is that it's diagnosed at, at later stages where the disease is already attacking maybe the kidney, the brain. And if it's diagnosed early and properly treated, these women are able to live healthy well, and productive lives. Well, one of the questions lives. that comes up all the time, used to come up all the time with women with lupus is, can I have a child when, when I have lupus? And of course, it's different for each individual, but in general, once you get the disease under control, what do you say to them about that? Um, where pregnancy is concerned, with lupus is always considered a high-risk pregnancy. So we do have a list of resources of different specialists, specifically um, OBGYN doctors who have an experience with lupus patients. And I know 
from um, my background is not a medical background, but from my years of experience, I do know that the doctors recommend that if they're trying to get pregnant, they do it when the lupus is in remission. Um, well, let's go to that for a second because that's a very important point about remission. Can you talk about um, that a little bit, what it means to have remissions and exacerbations? Okay. Um, lupus, nobody really knows what causes it and there's no cure for it. So you have it for your entire life. But there are periods when the uh, flares, which is also known when the disease is active, when you can have extreme fatigue, joint pain, you might be attacking the kidney or another organ, and then periods of remission when the disease is known to be asleep. You still have lupus, but it's not active. And some patients can be in remission for several years, several months. It all depends. So one thing that I have learned, no two cases are alike. Exactly. Everyone, it's different. You may have similar symptoms, similar experiences, but no two cases are alike. Now, the other point is, is does lupus tend to run in families? So if my mother has it, am I more likely to get it? What is the, the um, genealogy on that point? Lupus de does tend to run in families, but it's not just um, lupus. It's also other autoimmune diseases. So um, someone related to, would you name a couple of them? Well, diabetes is actually an autoimmune disease. Um, so somebody in the type family, one, <laughs> right? Type one. Sorry, yes. To be <laughs> yes. very specific. Yes. Um, so so somebody in the family might have, um, you mentioned, you know, fibromyalgia, somebody might have Sjogren's syndrome, and somebody might have lupus, somebody might have diabetes. So it's not necessarily just that the lupus might run in the family. The family may ha experience other autoimmune diseases, and lupus could be one of those. Right. And rheumatoid arthritis is in that, in that group, too. Yes. They, they tend to run together. So we now know what people can do. I hope our audience knows because all those numbers will show up. If they have a problem, the SLE, uh, let's get these names right. The Lu SLE Lupus Foundation. Foundation. Yes, and? The Brooklyn Lupus Center. The Brooklyn Lupus Center are here to help all of us in Brooklyn when you have questions or know someone who has questions about whether or not they have lupus. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you for Thank having you for us. your time. There are unfortunately still far too many people in Brooklyn who can't afford to buy enough food to eat. And too often, what they can't afford leads to added weight and increased odds of chronic disease. In Bed-Stuy, however, a campaign is underway to offer fresh, locally grown produce, even fresh honey, to those in need of assistance. Bedside Campaign Against Hunger is an organization that was founded 14 years ago and the purpose for um, establishing this organization was that we did a survey in the community and found out that one of the greatest need was lack of food and not that there weren't other pantries but that there was not enough food being distributed among the such a dense population. Our community approach to caring is to make sure families get healthy food. Because we serve over 11,000 individuals every month, we know we needed to find enough fruits and vegetables so that we can impact or help with those that are suffering from obesity, diabetes or within this program we need fresh fruits and veg. And this is all organic honey that Bedside Campaign Against Hunger give out to the people that are in need. Honey is not only for food but it can also be used to cure a cut. It's not just to eat. And I mean honey is a great thing. Now we've been coming up with 26, 2700 pounds of fruits and vegetables into the hands of families that need it the most. So right now we have collard greens here. We have harvested since the season started over 100 pounds of collard greens right here. Also with our kale, we have done 85 pounds of kale. Naturally grown food is expensive in the markets. 
When farmers come down, we understand that they have to recoup their cost. But we're right here and we're able to grow something to give individuals. The thing is that when a mother cannot afford to purchase um, two pounds of tomatoes, we can assist in that. And so with us, it's totally free. And we do also do a lot of herbs. And we have gotten over 30 pounds of herbs between um, rosemary, mint, basil, and sage. We have gotten some sage. So we have done quite a few, we have gotten a few um, herbs here. So now we have our eggplants growing up and we have peppers coming in. One, we don't just grow, we grow what they would like to see. There's a variety of ethnic groups here. And it's one thing to just grow one, you know, just grow what you feel like. But there are families that grow up on different fruits and veg, and we try to put it in. We're working on growing and building and beautifying Brooklyn as it is, and changing the way people eat. Brighton Beach is known for its beach, of course, its boardwalk, and its vibrant community of largely Russian immigrants. But like any neighborhood, it also includes some of the many New Yorkers who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Health Beach Julia Vassi found one particular Russian who's very determined to help. <laughs> It seems unorthodox to see an Orthodox Christian priest walking by produce stores in Brooklyn's Brighton Beach. But Father Vadim Arefyev is no stranger here. Every Tuesday he comes to this boulevard to look for homeless, drug and alcohol addicts, to preach and help them find a better life. Boxes of sandwiches and bowls of soup for starters are followed by an invitation to the wooden church of the unquenchable chalice, which has become a temporary home for those who have lost their way. That's what we have uh, as a church, uh, but it's officially not a church. A few guys can, can, mm -hmm. can live upstairs. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have a lot, a lot of guys we need to accommodate, we can even put mattresses all around here. Hundreds of addicts have gone through a three-month recovery program that Father Vadim launched a decade ago when he immigrated to the United States from Russia. You cannot uh, not just drink or use alcohol or, you know, you cannot uh, misbehave, uh, you know, against your brother. If you start cursing, it's not allowed. You'll, you'll be asked to leave. If you will start fighting, you know, God forbid, you know, immediately, you know, have to, you have to leave. Uh, so you have to learn how to live Christian life. And at the same time, you have to go and be obedient to your counselor, to the drug counselor. If, if, if drug counselor will say, okay, now it's time for you to, to start looking for a job. We will permit guys to start looking for a job after three weeks, being here and uh, total concentration on you know, prayer, um, you know, little, little work around the house, um, and, you know, and going to to rehab program. Like the one at Brooklyn's Coney Island Hospital, which has been treating addicts for over 40 years. Our medical center offers a 6 to 12 months program for adults over 18 years old. It includes medical treatment, chemical drug and alcohol counseling, recreational activities such as yoga, dancing, outside trips. We have about 200 patients involved in this rehab program. Vadi Kazarov Father Vadim's parishioner has just finished the recovery program. A year ago, alcohol addiction ruined all his plans. He has a college degree, used to run a successful business, and was about to get married. I had everything that I needed. Mm -hmm. I had a house, a car, but I just couldn't stop drinking. Drinking and drinking and drinking. I went to jail, I went to rehabs, many times, Rikers Island, rehabs, detoxes. And this man was seriously ill and could have lost his liver. One day unconscious, he was picked up by a good Samaritan and delivered to Father Vadim's parish. Without Father Vadim, I would have been dead. He changed me. I'm a different person now. Five percent of New Yorkers suffer from drug addiction. Eleven percent heavily consume alcohol. And as Father Vadim knows all too well, 
These are very common problems among Russian immigrants. Why am I drinking, father? You just don't want to stop. Sinner number one in the world is me. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling uh, my brotherhood, my homeless brotherhood, that, hey, let's, say, let's try to climb out of this terrible place together. These days, the priest himself needs help. His wooden church is about to be shut down and even demolished. Structures like this one violate the New York City Fire Safety Code. On top of that, the drunks and the homeless that find refuge at the church ignite the neighbors' fear and anger. Since they build the church, it disrupts our building. We have a lot of drunks. We have police attention here four or five day, times a day. We have ambulances three or four times a day. And it's awful. It's very bad for the neighborhood. Father Vadim receives dozens of complaints and has piles of unpaid fines. It would cost him over five million dollars to build a new church, and the priest has been struggling to raise money. He has worked miracles for his parishioners, and only a miracle will save his parish. For Health Beat Brooklyn, this is Julia Vassi. That's all for this month. If you want to watch past episodes of the show, go to brickartsmedia.org slash BIT and then click on HealthBeat Brooklyn. And you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter on BK Independent TV. Right now, information about the programs and hospitals we've just featured is about to appear on your TV screen. Thanks for watching and stay healthy. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.